thank you for tuning in, joining us today, and we're just going to continue on our series of First Fruits. I want, want to look at uh, the story of Job. As we look at First Fruits, we've been talking about how First Fruits is tied, tied to giving. Uh, anytime God's about to do increase into your life, he always demands First Fruit. One of the things that we look at, uh, one of the aspects we looked at is the fact that First Fruits is also connected to relationship and is connected to people. One of the stories I think that we can really see this uh, is in the story of Job. Many of you are familiar with Job. Um, we know that he suffered some stuff. We know that God ended up restoring him. But I want to go a little more in detail. I've said this to our church uh, a little while ago, and the Holy Spirit placed it back on my heart because I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that now we're reaching a, a greater audience. So what I want you to do, if you would, turn to uh, the book of Job. We're going to start at chapter 1, and we're going to draw our attention to uh, verse 1. Um, down through verse 5. And the word of God says, And there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and screwed evil. So when we first look at this, and it, it describes Job coming out the gate as Job being this man that's doing what he's supposed to do. Notice it says that he was perfect. This does not mean that he was without blemish, but what it means, and I want you to write this down, that it, it means that he reached a level of maturity that was expected out of him. He was upright, and uh, he feared God, and his lifestyle reflected by him shunning from evil. Verse 2 says, And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. So Job had a total of ten kids. It was also considered a blessing if uh, someone had boys. So notice out of the ten, seven were boys. So we see Job uh, being blessed relationally. Uh, verse 3 says his substance also was uh, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, uh, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and, and, and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east. So if you were to total all of that, we look at Job's financial state without talking about his homes and, and those things. Job had what would be equivalent to $790,000 worth of stuff. And so even the text shows that out of everybody in the east, Job was considered the greatest. Verse 4 says, and his sons went and feast in their homes, and one and, and very one his day sent and called for their sisters and, to eat with them and to drink with them. So verse 4 shows that even though Job was upright, his children was not. Verse 5 says, and it was so when the days of their feasting was gone about that Job sent and sacrificed them and say, I'm sorry, and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So what scripture tell us in, in the first five verses, it proves that relationally in verse two, Job was blessed. Financially in verse three, Job was blessed. Verse 5, Job was blessed spiritually, so we see relational, financial, spiritually, there's increase in the life of Job. But verse 4 intervenes and says that his children uh, did not have the same relationship with God. They entertained things they should not. Verse 5 shows that Job was a man of integrity because now Job says, let me offer and intercede on their behalf because my kids are living in sin. This says a lot to me because now we look at Job to me, he's the perfect individual right here, the perfect example. Here it is that Job is, is, is wealthy. He, he is relationally wealthy. He's financial wealthy. He prays. He intercedes on behalf of his family, the stuff that they're not doing right. So not only he's concerned about his relationship with God, he's concerned about his kids' family relationship with God. And it shows that the children, that the sons, they would get together all the time and then encourage their sisters to come. So all 10 of the children are just living it up at the expense of dad. I can understand that many of you may be at that place as well when you, your real idea of seeing God bless everyone, it's not just financially, it's not just materialistic, but you want to see everybody hungry after the things of God. So we see that Job was seeking after God that his whole household walk in God's perfect will. So it would beg to, to answer the, ask the question, so why is it that now when Satan approached God on concerning Job, it seems as though God would have said, you know what, Job is doing the best he can. He's, he's meeting the requirements. The Bible says that he was perfect, which means he reached a level of maturity. Why in the world would God try Job? Easy. 
why would he try you? After you decide to do right, after you decide to surrender every aspect of your life over to God, you're doing the, the, the most that he's requiring out of you. If he deals with you about something, you're quick to repent. You're quick to lay that problem at the altar of God. You're continually seeking him. You're, you're praying consistently. You're, and we talked about this as it relates to first fruits, that uh, first fruit deals with increase. So every time God gives you another day, he's actually uh, giving you it's your opportunity to first fruit. So when you seek God before you start anything throughout your day, here's what you're showing God, that I, I recognize that you gave me this day that I don't deserve. So let me first fruit that day. Matter of fact, we see it in verse 5. It says that not only did, they, did Job pray, he sanctified them, but the Bible says he, ro he rose up early in the morning, which means that before Job started his day, he sought God. Job was first fruiting God every day, and yet Job still got tried. In your carnal mind, you could say, well, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, God, how in the world could you love me so much and allow Satan to tempt me, to come at me, to try me? Because we see now that this, there's this negotiation going on in heaven that Satan uh, uh, says that, well, you know, this is what I've been doing. And it's God who says, well, how about Job? You thought about him and and." There's an inventory out on Job because Satan said, well, I know he does this, this and this. And, and while the Bible tells us there's four things about Job, that he was perfect, he was upright, he feared God, he, he shunned evil. Satan came back with five things, the five things that Satan says, but, but do, do Job fear you for not? In other words, that is it because you gave him this stuff? He says, I, I, I consider him, number two, but thou hast put a hedge about him. In other words, you're covering him. And this is something that I need you to understand. In your seeking God, in your you chasing after God, Scripture constantly points to the fact that there's this hedge that God puts around those that walk upright before him. In other words, that the enemy cannot come at you and attack you beyond God's allowing. And so now this becomes a problem as well because someone says, well, why would God love me so much and he allow the enemy to, to come at me, to, to attack me? And, and that, I believe, draws to the fact that many people wrestle with uh, our RSD, which is known as rejection sensitive dysphoria. They struggle with rejection so much that the moment things don't go their way, even as they're dealing with God, they feel that God is, is punishing them and never consider what if he is interviewing me for the next level? What if God is, is seeking to promote me, but there are some things I need to go through to prove I'm ready for that promotion? Why is it that the moment you get inconvenienced, you start to look at it from a negative perspective? Here's what I believe. I believe that we all bring every relationship that we've had with humans into our relationship with God. So let's say, for instance, you didn't have a good relationship with your dad, and, and, and it even bothers you to call God your father because you have a negative connotation with father. And so now if you say God is my father and it sounds real good, your life is blessed, people telling you that you're blessed, it seems like everything you touch turns to gold, and you say, yeah, this is what my father does because my God, my father, he owned a cattle on a thousand hills. But what happens when those, those cattle start dying off? What happens when the, the cattle start rolling down the hill and, and the cattle you thought were yours are not yours anymore? We see this with Job. So it is God that brings up the saints. Hey, have you thought about him? And saints said, look, I've already been watching him. We already have an inventory on him. Here's what I need you to understand. And, and what's amazing, even in this time that we, we are practicing social distancing. And so many people are saved or saved a month ago, seeking God and real spiritual. But over the last uh, few weeks, you haven't been on point. Is it because no one's around you now? Is it because you can't shine in your spirituality? Is it because... That really hasn't been your heart. You've been after what people can see. I'm just, just, just asking the question. So we see that, that Satan, let me continue as well, those five things. It says, and Satan says, number three, thou hast blessed the work of his hand. So in other words, Job could be doing right because you don't allow him to prosper. You know, it's easier serving God when everything is going good. I mean, when there's no trials, no tribulation, the worst thing that happened to you this morning, you stump your pinky toe and that hurt for a few seconds. And all of a sudden, you know, you're going throughout your day. Oh, that, that's, that's easy. Even say, so that, that's easy. He, he says the fourth thing he says, his substance is increased. So Joe, even Satan says, Job been increasing. You've been blessing him. And, and the fifth one says, and touch his stuff and he will curse you. God said, really? I tell you what, you go ahead and do it. Touch him. All of a sudden now, if you would, 
phrase says, all hell breaks loose in Job's life. Not only do, does he lose a child, he loses all ten. Just like this. In an instant. All ten kids he's been believing God for is no longer. He get raided. His cattle. Everything he has, he leaves. I just tallied up before you. According to verse 2, Job had at least $790,000 worth of stuff gone in an instant. Here's the thing that I love. If you fast forward to the end of chapter 1, verse 22 says, in all this. And if you follow me, you, put, you got your Bibles, I want you to bracket that off. In all this, Job saying not, nor, here's the kicker, charge God foolishly. In all this. So let me ask you, in all this for you, are, are you going through something right now that you feel like God is unjust for allowing you to go through? And you're, you're recognizing that this level of warfare, thank you, Holy Spirit, is now causing your commitment level to win. The things that you said that you wouldn't do anymore, now, now you're giving thought to them. Because things are not going your way. That, that's another level of temptation that when now when you're at a season of trying and testing and God is now allowing you to be the first fruit offering for your family, for your bloodline, for your neighborhood, for your job. That's this temptation that hits you that, that says, is it worth it? Is it really worth it? Living right, is it really worth saying no to sin if God's going to allow this stuff to happen to me anyway? I've been doing what I'm supposed to do, and I paid my tithes, I gave my offerings, and how is it that, I, that they, they, they're cutting back my hours? I haven't been to work in two to three weeks. They're not paying us. Uh, I don't know how things are going to happen. I still need to pay my rent. I still need to pay my mortgage. The kids still have their needs. Matter of fact, they're at home right now, and the light bill is going up. The gas bill is going up, and it seems like I'm losing, Pastor Shelley. So, so I, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been thinking about entertaining some stuff that I said I wasn't going to do anymore because I'm, I'm battling on the inside of my heart. If God is so loving it and he's so just, I've been doing what he asked me to do. How in the world could he allow this stuff to happen to me? That comes with the temptation. That comes with the warfare. That comes with the next level. How do you know you're a first true offering? You should be right where, where, where we are right now as we deal with Job. But here's the test. The test is this, and that's why Satan said, ah, ah you're saying he's doing right, but if, if you begin to touch this stuff, he's going to really be tried. And, and that's where you are right now. I know you, you, you talked about God being all this wonderful stuff. You've been putting out all these great posts, but now, now he's hitting you. Now you're being tried. Now, here's the thing. Could it be that you have been faithful to God because you're really looking for his hand and not his face? Pastor, what does that mean? It means that, that as long as he's giving you, you're good. But if you feel like you're losing, then maybe God is not who you thought he was. Maybe, what's the point? Why, why, watch this, since there's somebody watching me right now, you're, you're looking at someone who's not saved, they're not doing right, and it doesn't appear to you that they're going through as much as you are, and so now you're wondering, well, shoot, it, you know, they doing this, and God's still blessing them. They, they doing X, Y, and Z, and, and they haven't lost their job. They still going to work. So what's the point? The point is maybe they are not the first fruit. You are. When you give your heart to God, you're saying you're my Lord. If you didn't know this, that means ruler of. Now imagine someone makes you ruler of something, but the moment you start working with that thing to get it to where you need it to be, it's get, it gets snatched from you and say, no, I don't want you to do it that way. There's somebody that's watching me now. That's what you're doing with your life. You don't mind giving God your life as long as everything is going well. But the moment you get uncomfortable, you snatch your life back. Now you begin to do things on your own as if you're saying, I can do this, God, better than you. Good luck with that. The truth of the matter is, I believe that you should be so entrenched inside of his will that even if you thought about snatching your life back, you have nothing to snatch. Because the life that you've given up has been so far removed from you, even your own opinions doesn't matter. Hopefully you have walked away from sin so, so long that when you turn back, you can't even see it. 
Even if you have the temptation to go back to it, when you turn around, it's not there. You got to go so far back to get to it. You got you to go make so many different phone calls to find that person who's going to deal with you. You, you got you to gotta go through so many different things just to mess up. That lets you know how far you don't walk away from it. But there's others of you, as soon as you turn around, it's right there. Why? Because you haven't walked away as far as you, you say you have. Well, Job doing right, he still got tried. And I believe he still got tried because God was seeking to do something in Job's life that he has never done before. Here's the, here's the next place of temptation that you got to look at. Be careful when you begin to compare yourself with everybody else because the problem is they may tell you you're the greatest in the East, but from God's perspective, he's not trying to make you the greatest in the East. He's trying to make you the greatest in your generation. And so now you may water down what God has already done, not understanding he's trying to get you to another place. And in the midst of him getting you to another place, you want pats on the back for where you are and not understanding it's not over yet. And see, that's, that, that, that concept alone should keep you humble when God begins to bless your life. Because when I'm finding out that this is a never-ending process. So if I, I know there's moments where we kind of stop for a minute. We catch our breath and we praise God for what he's done and all that he's doing right now. And we thank him for what he's about to do. And it's like you, you, you get, you're gathering yourself because you've just been through a fight. And all of that is great. That's wonderful. I, I commend you. Do it. Take a three-day vacation. Take a seven-day vacation. Whatever it is you, you, you can afford to do. But while you're taking that vacation uh, uh, with your surroundings, don't, don't take that vacation inside of your heart. And what I mean by that is don't start comparing yourself to people around you and say, you know what, I, I've made it. Out of all of my relatives and my siblings, my house is the biggest. Out of everybody that I know, I'm making more than them. Out of these group of people, they told me I'm, I'm the one. I, I was voted most likely to uh, succeed and, and, and look. Uh, it happened. What's success? <laughs> your measuring stick is not your neighbor. Your measuring stick is God's will for your life. What did he make you for? Why did he take you through everything he's taken you through? Job was at $790,000 worth of stuff. Ain't no telling what was about to come. But, but here's the thing. In order for Job to get to the next level, he had to go through something. Watch this. That was not self-inflicted. I want to add this. I don't know if we can, you know, they'll roll this in in a clip. I don't know if infringement rights. I saw a video yesterday, and I, I, I tagged my wife in the video because I want her to see it. And it, this man was hanging on the side of the building. Obviously, you could tell he was on the side of the building because he, he was uh, attempting suicide or so it seemed. But the rescue workers then get on the, side, on the outside of the building, and they're holding him, and they'll pry him away from the wall so they can save his life. As they pry him away from the wall, the, the weight of them both comes down and causes a, a, a bungee jump effect on the rope. So when they got to the end of the rope, it, it, it bounced and, and just so happened that a rescue worker drops the man. The moment he is dropped, you hear the man screaming as he, he's falling down the side of the building. Because at that moment, the man realized, I, I don't want to die. Now, I thought about, the family could say, here's on video, y'all killed my dad. But, but my argument would be, but how did he get on the side of the building anyway? He was on the side of the building because he had already considered killing himself. Well, he probably thought he wanted to die that day until he got dropped. And he screamed because... He didn't want to get dropped. He, as a matter of fact, he didn't want to die. But the problem was it's too late. And here's what I'm trying to help somebody recognize. They could easily try to sue them and blame the rescue workers for doing their job. But will anybody stand up and say, but how did he get on the side of the building? And did he lose his life because the rescue worker dropped him, or did he lose his life because he climbed on the side of the building? I would say he lost his life because he climbed on the side of the building. But I want to encourage somebody who have been trying to be rescue workers for people. People put themselves in situations and we come along and try to save them. And sometimes we just might drop them. But they're not going to say how they got on the side of the building. They're not going to say what drove them to say that they want to lose their life. You know what they're going to do? They're going to blame the rescue worker. 
They're going to say, you know what, if you were saved and you had love, you would have answered my phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning. I know you've answered 99 times, but this time, can't, why didn't you answer? Forget the fact that your phone was on the charger and it, it wasn't on. You had on airplane mode. Forget the fact that you was battling the cold yourself and you was a little woozy, you was a little sick, and the night quit that you took put you in a deep sleep and you didn't hear the phone. But they're going to say, you know, see, that's why I don't like dealing with church people because, you know, they drop you. You can't trust them. You know, they, they did this to me and they did that. But, but I want to encourage someone's heart. If, if God has assigned you to be a rescue worker and you have been called to be the first fruit offering, please understand you may get blamed for dropping somebody when in actuality your whole motivation was to try to rescue them. They're not going to talk about the state of their life before you came along. They're just going to talk about after you talented me, I died. I want to encourage your heart. Continue doing what you're doing. Don't quit being who God wants you to be simply because it did not work out with this person. And I like to say that it's an example of you being a first fruit offering. There are some people that's listening to me now. Uh, Pastor, your, your church uh, began to wean. And it wasn't uh, because your bad, bad preaching or teaching. And, and there, obviously there are things inside of you, your establishment that can be improved. But let's be honest, the truth of the matter is people walk away from God, they're going to eventually walk away from you. I know they're not going to say it because they're talking to other people who don't really have a strong relationship with God, so if they just acknowledge him uh, while they eating their breakfast, they feel like that's all that, that they need to do. And so you, you, you wrestle with, well, why, why are they leaving? Well, let me encourage you, across the country, people are leaving. <laughs> you just don't see it with people with bigger ministries because they can shill off the empty seats, whereas in your church, they are noticeable. And while you're believing God for, well, where the people gone? Um, then this hits, and now you're scrambling around to try to hold on to the few that you have. Make sure that your heart stay connected to God. The fact that you was concerned about the empty seats proved that your heart was being pulled away. Even right now, God is getting you to the place to, to lay that foundation again, to continue to seek after him, to make sure that your motives are right, to make sure that you're concerned about being effective and not being famous. It doesn't mean that God is judging you right now, but you're being tested as everyone is. But what I want to encourage you to do, go back to the basics again. This is your time to get away. This is your time to seek after him. This is your time to, to get back into the word like you used to. It's okay. You're being tested. You're the first fruit. If it wasn't enough for Job to lose everything materialistically, one of the greatest kickers was the fact that once Satan came back after Job, seeing not, watch this, and then charged God foolishly, which means he blamed God for the stuff. Satan said, well, but what if we go at him again and we touch his body and God echoes and says, you know what? Great idea. You can, you can attack his body, but don't take his life. Now, it takes on another level because it's one thing to visit someone in the hospital because they got pain, but it's another thing if you're laying there and you're in pain. It's another thing that God has used your hands to lay on people to help them get healed. And you quote Isaiah 53, ups and frontwards, backwards, and all that. But then when you touch yourself, nothing happens. You pray for other people, and they felt the glory of the Lord. Matter of fact, you did too as you prayed, but now you need God to touch your body, and it's not working. Sickness has a way of challenging everyone's faith. Um, I just believe, you know, women have a grace that men don't have as it relates to their body being attacked. I, you know, I, don't know, I don't know all the details of that. I can't explain to you, but I just believe it is. Uh, Women go through stuff that men, we, we, if we get a snippet of it, we go crazy. I can't imagine people who've had a bout of cancer. I've seen people overcome some tremendous things. Uh, but also seen people like myself, if I, if I get a cold, I get a flu, the world has ended. Y'all need to shut everything down. We need to get this fixed. Um, do I still trust God? How do we know? If you're sick, you got the flu, your body's saying, stay in the bed, but your spirit is saying, but we have to first fruit God. Will you get up 
at your normal intercessory prayer time. And you may not be able to war like you used to because you're coughing and you're sneezing and your head is about to explode. But maybe you can praise. Maybe you can worship. In other words, will the attack against your flesh keep you from your commitment that you made? Again, people get inconvenienced. Lord forbid somebody wakes up on a Sunday morning they don't feel right. Automatically, the first thing they say, I'm not going to church today. That's the, and they get worse by Monday, but guess what they're going to say on Monday? Let me go on into this job. They already trying to get rid of me. Isn't that amazing? You feel worse on Monday, it is not even a thought whether or not you should go to work. You, you then press your way. But on Sunday morning, you say, well, I don't want to get everybody else sick. Yeah, you can go up in the balcony and sit in the corner. Just being in the presence of God may bring a place of healing. But you see how my point is, you see how quick we can jump off that commitment with God, but we want him to shower us all the time. It is amazing that the very job that you say God gave you, you, you will be faithful to that. But when God asks you to come into his presence, whether it be at home, one-on-one, -on -one, or coming into the house of God, you, you come up with excuses. So my point is, are you really ready for the next level? Have God made you a first fruit offering, but your immaturity is, is keeping God from moving? Well, we see that Job's body gets attacked, you know. Uh, according to verse 9, um, Job's wife even encouraged him to, hey, curse God and die. Because according to their belief system that if you were to curse God, you know, he has the right to destroy you on the spot. So, so in her loving him, maybe she was saying, baby, just, let's just get this over with. I lost 10 children. I think I can handle losing a husband. I just want this to stop. See, sometimes you have to be careful even when the person that's laying beside you tell you something. And it could be they're tired of the suffering. And that's something people don't consider. They don't, they don't consider the fact that who you marry, you marry their warfare. You marry their calling. You marry their assignment. So whatever it is that God's going to take them through, you have to go through with them. So if you want to get with someone, they're not saved. And the Bible tells us be not equally yoked with unbelievers, but you in love. Have you considered, well, what are they going to have to go through to get them to break their heart before God? Whatever that is, I'm willing to go through that process. And here's the crazy part. They can go through so much breaking it and still don't get broken. Joe, friends come along and they're, you know, spiritual, I would say. You know, I don't think they were hating on Joe. Because all, you know, if you sum up that the most of the book is, is about his friends and his conversation. And they say, Joe, I mean, if you're doing what you say you did, man, explain to me why this happening to you. Because, Joe, what secret sin have you been doing that we don't know about? Just repent of that thing, man, and God will turn everything around. Because you haven't been doing what you're supposed to do. Why are we looking at all this destruction? And Job is saying, no, oh, man, I'm telling you, I've been doing what I'm supposed to do. I don't know why this is happening. All I know is, watch this, Job began to talk about how great God was. He began to talk about the characteristics of God, which shows that, that, that Job learned some stuff. He began to say that, you know what, this can't be a bad thing because I just know God is this. He, he, he began to exalt God and, and, and talk about how he knew him, and he focused on the characteristics of God. This is going to offend somebody because it, when, when, you, when people go through things, it, it gives us the opportunity to see what do you see God characteristics as being. You know, when you start hearing people talk about God doing the suffering, then that points to how well they really know him. And so Job is like, hey, man, I'm telling you, I haven't done wrong. I, I don't know why I'm going through this. I can't explain it to you, but I just know who God is. So his whole hope was on the God that he knew in the time of plenty. So what we don't get to read is how, what all did Job have to go through to get to the place that he had, his stuff was at 790,000. We, we don't know that. All we do know is Job is passing his test of first fruit. Why? Because God done increased him and he's still going before God. Isn't it amazing that somebody can be asking God to increase them in the moment he does their commitment level shift? I believe, personally, it's because that's what you wanted anyway. You, know, you never was after God's face. You was after his hand. And once you're after God's faith and not just his hand, he can bless you, but you want him more than what he gave you. I mean, think about it. In a relationship that we have, if you give somebody something and they say thank you, but they put the thing down and then come to you and, and wrap their arms around your neck, 
they're showing you, I care more about you than the thing you gave. But where do you think you got that from? You got it from the God that made you. He's testing somebody right now. Do you want him or do you want the stuff that he can give you? Well, for the sake of time, if you flip to the last book, which is chapter 42, the Bible says that, that Job makes a declaration. He says God to, in, in verse 5 of chapter 42, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Job breaks in and says, you know what, man? God, I can say I saw a whole nother level of you that I didn't know. Watch this. And it took me going through this to see it. Could it be that you're being tried because God is trying to show you another aspect of who he is? That without this trial, you would not know him this way? I, I would say that's his motivation. I would say you're a perfect candidate to be the first fruit offering. If you continue, God begins to deal with Job's friends. And here's the thing that we have to do next. It says, verse 10 says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job, watch this, when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. God is raising up some people who are willing to be the first fruit offering. That you, your mindset and heart has to be, though they slay me, yes, will I trust them. In other words, that whoever the enemy uses, or if God uses, to come at you, say things about you, uh, want to see your destruction, whatever it is. I believe that we get a chance to see God in a way we've yet to see him before when we go through things that are not self-inflicted. If you find yourself going through something that's not self-inflicted, you didn't go through it because you put yourself on the side of the building. You, you didn't go through it because you are the one that was driving and got a DUI. It wasn't because you showed up late to work. You was faithful. You was doing what you're supposed to do. Matter of fact, someone told you they considered you for a promotion. Suddenly, this pandemic hits, and uh, they start out saying maybe you need to work from home. Now you're not even sure if you're going to have a job. Um, here's the thing I want to encourage you. The same God that gave you that job has more. Uh, there's another level of increase that's coming to your life. How do we know? Here's how God math works. God doesn't just take, take away and then add. Here's what he does. He, what's, the, what's the fastest way to take away? It's not subtraction. It's division. What's the fastest way to increase you? It's not adding. It's called multiplication. So if you're going to ask God for multiplication, here's what you've got to understand. God is going to first not subtract from you. He's going to divide from you. <laughs> he's going to take. He, he, he's going to ask for something. And all he's doing is making room for what he's about to give you. Oh, that, that's the truth of the matter. Here's what's happening. He takes what you have because we are finite beings, which means we're limited. He, he takes what you consider to be your all. But in order to give you more, he doesn't add more to that, that, that bucket or that amount. He doesn't do it that way. What he does, he, he takes what you have. So now you, you have capacity to do this. He takes and then you go here. But when you're going here, the work that he's doing as you're going back down is actually strengthening you that when he pulls you again, he's going to expand you further than your ability to be expanded at first. See, so when you reach your capacity at this level, he doesn't add to you and then you, you go here because when, if he starts doing that, it's going to be even more uncomfortable and, and, and you're not prepared. See, he has to prepare you before he places you. So what God does is, is take where you are, then he, he, he divides, you go in. But as you're going in, watch this, your heart shifts. As your heart shifts, you, be you begin to now make yourself available for more increase. Now when God's beginning to add, watch this, you find out that your capacity to receive is greater because he had to take from you first. But while he was taking, watch this, you didn't charge God foolishly. Charge God foolishly. While he was taking, you, you kept your attitude right. While he was taking, you said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. While, while he's taking from you, you you're saying, Lord, I, I can't quite feel you like I used to, but I know you either on my right or you on my left. You wasn't there. I go front with backwards. You, I can't perceive you not. But you know the way that I take. And when you have tried me, I shall come forth as prayer go. You, you, in other words, the characteristics of God begins to stand up when your flesh don't, don't like what's going on. Here's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're making yourself, you're giving yourself room for, for greater. Here's what happens. 
God then gives him twice as much. So in other words, that, that Job had a capacity of 790K. After God took him through, he had a capacity to have 1,580,000 worth. Just like this. Everything that he had been through was an afterthought. So the thing I want to encourage somebody who's watching me now, the thing that has tears running down your eyes, will one day be an afterthought. Here's the kicker. Then we got to start all over again. You get to the 790K, then you move to the 1.58. Um, hey, don't get comfortable <laughs> because if he's going to get you uh, to the 3 million level, you got to go through something else. So never get high-minded, never get exalted. Recognize that your life is a first fruit offering. And God always wants to increase you until the day that you die, in some form, spiritually, relationally, financially. There's some people that's in your life relationally. Uh, they walked away from you. God is making room for new people. It could be someone with a new name, or it could be that very person that is going to begin to be a new person. I want to speak to that person whose marriage is being challenged. God is taking you guys through some challenges so that you can have a better relationship. Because the husband that you had six months ago can't be the husband that you need a year from now. So God is allowing y'all to go through something. But guess what? You're losing the old husband, and you're going to gain a new one. You're losing the old wife, and you're going to gain a new one. But God has to take away first before he can add. He has to divide before he multiplies. Increase is coming in your life. How do we know? Because you're being tried. Maybe it's not self-inflicted. Maybe it's his will. In all things, be thankful, whether you're having a good day, a bad day, or an in-between day. Lord, I thank you. And if he gives you the opportunity to wake up tomorrow, first through God. In other words, spend time with him before you start your day. Don't let the circumstances or, or situation dictate you going before him. Start your day off. Before you do anything, seek him. That way, if you hear bad news that, that, that day, oh, well, God, I gave you glory before. If, if you hear something that changed your life, God, I gave you glory before. Either way, first fruit God, because you ultimately is the first fruit offering. May God bless you and continue to add to your life. I hope this was a blessing to you. I want to encourage you to look over these verses. Study while you got free time on your hand. Let it get on the inside of your heart. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's what you say out of your, your mouth to your situation that was going to dictate the increase or the lack thereof. Pass the test. You can do it. Great well. God is setting you up for something more imaginable than you ever know. I believe it with everything in me. May we see you again, and may God continue to bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.